Uh, now, hello everyone and welcome to the fifth and final edition of this year's online discussion, a feminist uh, exploration. Uh, we are very pleased to have you all with us and I hope you're tuned in and tapped on to today's discussion which will be on visibility and symbolic politics. Uh, so to introduce myself, I'm Pauline Mukanza. I'm part of the executive committee of the European Women's Lobby, and I'm also from the European YWSA, a pan-European young women's movement. And uh, I'm uh, pleased to let my co-moderator uh, introduce herself. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Francesca Schmidt. I'm a senior program officer for feminist digital policy at the Gunnar Werner Institute for Feminism and Gender Democracy here in Berlin. Great, thank you. And so um, as you see now, this session is uh, co-moderated between myself and Francesca, and we're proud to host this event in support with the Henrich Boll Foundation of the European Union and Gunda Werner Institute. I hope I said that right. Uh, we, the initiators of the series, uh, are a network uh, in the making. We are a combination of feminists, scholars, activists, advocates who collectively come together to fight against the uh, backlash of the far right and uh, to create a strong bond of feminist solidarity all over Europe and beyond. So uh, please note that this event will be recorded as the others and you'll be able to watch all of these uh, uh, on a YouTube channel of the Henry Fold Foundation. So, uh, if you want to look at any, watch any other uh, of the series or rewatch this one, it will be available for you in uh, on the YouTube channel. Please see the chat where you can also f see the, the link to the YouTube channel. Thank you. Okay, last time Peggy Piche introduced us to the foundations of intersectionality. While intersectionality as a term has gained a lot of popularity in discourse, there is still a gap between discourse and the concrete application in policies, practices and legislation. Peggy stressed that whenever policy decisions are made above the heads of the groups that are affected, a void is created. This empty space is created whenever affected groups are not given a seat at the table, are not allowed to have the space to speak for themselves and make their interests heard. This brings us to the question of today's exploration. Whose politics are visible and whose expertise is marginalized? Whose voices are heard and whose are deliberately silenced in public discourse, media, policymaking and academia? What is visibility and what does it entail? Why is it not enough to create attention through visibility? What, does, uh, what do the claims to make voices heard and make people on the margin seen truly mean? And what are the power structures that form such reality? Visibility does not equal liberation. But how can it become a tool to, liber to liberate people? And this is true for many debates. Therefore, we want to address the intersection of LGBTI, QA asterisks and refugee rights and dedicate this uh, edition to the visibility of those groups in its relation to power structures. We are very glad to welcome Faris Gucci Gassain, a speaker for an honest conversation on visibility and its contribution and translation into liberation. So next to you, Pauline. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about our speaker, Faris, uh, is a performing artist and intersectional, intersectional LGBTIQA um, asterisk advocate using different media to promote social change and to start a conversation for change on issues they face while navigating day to day life as a non binary uh, Ethiopian African LGBTQI asterisk person. We want to talk about what visibility implies and gone beyond the, the notion of visibility as the end goal when it's only the step towards true liberation to take a step further towards more equal justice and liberation we need to go beyond the more the mere idea of visibility that is appealing to many we need to ask the difficult questions Paris will raise some of these difficult questions and talk us through the implications of visibility and symbolic politics towards true liberation. 
So please feel free to submit any questions you have in the Q&A tool at the bottom of the, of the screen. Uh, we will discuss them uh, as we open up the discussion uh, after the input from Faris. Uh, please note that we will not accept disrespectful comments and participants who do not follow this rule will be removed, unfortunately. Now, we're very glad to give the floor to Faris, please. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as intense the vibrations of the moment is, around the world, but I'm glad to be here and to be uh, with you here uh, and discuss about um, the important work of visibilities and also like, you know, how, uh, how visibilities are not equal to integration and but how can we challenge ourselves to push um, for a liberation and to make it a tool that was intended to be uh, for a liberation. Uh, but before I go on, I would like to thank uh, the platform for having me here and also particularly I would like to thank Sarah for invitation, for inviting me and, and also for my co-moderator for beautiful introductions of what we are going to discuss and then also like um, what we uh, are planning to do. Uh, but before I go that, like, let me just give a, a very also depth um uh, introductions of like you know how my work is because uh the conversations i want to bring is um i don't consider myself a scholar person but uh i always um analyze my uh the, the analyze the things i go through uh the thing i face because of my identities and how it's interlayered and um what's the reality outside and then also how it's matching with myself and also body who look like me and also who has similar identities and politics and all and so on. Um, on top of uh, the introductions, um, I my work also goes to uh, to the South the Global LGBT Firms, which is a, um, an or like which is an, um, a global platform that touch uh, that brings different activists advocates on LGBTI plus um uh, community um but also it goes to me co-founding and being the former executive director for uh for uh, dana social group it is uh the first self-organized lgbti grassroots organization aiming to improve the health and advocate for visibility of ethiopian queer community and also I'm also co-founded another organizations and platform that advocates for LGBTI rights uh, in Ethiopia and in the diaspora globally, and focusing uh, on changing the attitudes of the social attitude and uh, forcing the Ethiopian government to have an inclusive and intersectionally inclusive uh, policies and legislation, and on top of, and then also demanding the decriminalization of queer bodies in Ethiopia. Um, but also, again, my work also goes into here in Austria as, as a refugee Black from the continent and non-binary person, um, how I see myself and how the, the work of visibility, especially in the queer community, um, needed a space. And, and I'm not alone in that. And my work goes, goes also uh, by actively participating in an organization called um, um, Afro Rainbow in Austria. It is the first organization um, established by and for Africans uh, from the continent Africa and then uh, the African descent diaspora uh, of LGBTI plus uh, persons um, living in Austria. And also, again, again, like um, 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 the, the, the reason I'm also like, you know, um, touching all of these works is also to showcase how intersectionality is very important and how the work of visibility that is done by uh, marginalized people, um, how it's being heard, how it's being seen, and who is seeing it, and all that kind of things, and the politics around it. So another work also that goes to is the work I do in Queer Base, where I work as a program um, a program coordinator for um, a, a project 
called uh, a, a queer safe belonging that focus on uh, three very important and critical realities of queer refugees here in Austria. One is a mental health, and two is building the capacity of self-defense and de-escalation techniques for fleeing uh, body. When I say fleeing, I meant uh, uh, femme presenting, lesbian, intersex, non-binaries, and trans and female bodies. And also building a community by uh, by creating a strategy that is decentering um, by decentering uh, uh, by decentering substance that potentially can be abused. Um, and in all of these conversations, I would also would like to talk about the important uh, the definitions of uh, intersectionality personally for me. And um, I would like to quote. Uh, the executive director, Dr. Um, Emilia Roy from the Center for Intersectional Justice in Berlin. Uh, and she put it in a definition which is very practical and very simple for me. Um, and she and I quote here, it says, intersectionality is, is very simple. It is about fighting discriminations within the discrimination. It's empowering minorities within the minority and tackling the inequality within the inequality. And this is a perfect, a perfect um, definition and a very simple and practical definition of intersectionality for me. Um, uh, and that is exactly what today is about. Uh, feminist Explore, organized by Feminist Body, uh, and also uh, by um, cis women and also a uh, different spectrum version of uh, female body. Um, me uh, being me being invited on this space as a black refugee femme and non-binary person to discuss visibilities and the politics of being seen and the translations to the actual liberations is actually the literal representation for intersectionality for me. Um, so um, how I wanted to talk about the uh, the visibilities and its actual translations to the liberations is. Uh, based on the analysis I, I made uh, back in July 2018 uh, during Berlin Pride, uh, I made a sign that was that says uh, visibility is not equal to liberation, uh, which follows with the following statement, which I would like to read out. Even though we see queer visibilities, we should be cautious on the translations of the visibility uh, and on the translations of that visibility. Uh, to liberation, meaning access to any systematic and structural service that is quite heterosexual um, guests. And we have to also be conscious and work on the dismantling any system that is oppressive. Um, we are still living in a planet uh, where 72 uh, countries um, consider same-sex uh, same love and sexual act and gender, which is outside of the heteronormative uh, and illegal, and where all the uh, all the, the basic human rights being violated, and we have and we have to dismantle um, the polit uh, politically. Uh, I'm, sorry, uh, I will just repeat myself here. Uh, we have to dismantle that. Uh, we are seeing in global norms where all the right uh, wing people and politicians chopping away the rights uh, that has been achieved previously. Uh, we have to continue dismantling what is rightfully our, uh, ours, which is the human right. Uh, so before I interrogate also against uh, visibilities, uh, I would like also to give a very simple definition of visibility for me. Uh, it is the um, equality or the state of being um, visible. Uh, sorry, it is the quality or the state of being visible. When I say visible, capable of being seen. And when it comes to this practicality, such definitions that uh, where the pol uh, where the politics kicks in. Uh, the, uh, the further you are away uh, from being rich, cis male. Uh, what man, what uh, man, the further you are going to access um, 
power and the further you are going to be seen. And this hierarchy is also in indoctrinated by the white supremacy um, through the tools of imperialism, colonialism, and neocolonialism, manifestations of all day to day life of um, our day to day life activity, uh, our day to day life activity, which is through um, racism, ableism, xenophobia, fatphobia, homophobia, you name it. Um, so, uh, as, as I also like, you know, um, analyze all this. Um, um, realities and questions, uh, questions uh, such as like, you know, what is already being mentioned is like, um, um, who is visible, um, who is allowed to be visible, and also um, when we are being visible, who is the visibility is being seen. And, Sorry, um, Chris, that's a very, before we go more deep, to like who's visible, which is very important. Do you mind closing the door behind you so we can hear you properly? Thank you. Ah, sorry, sorry. No, okay. no worries. You don't want to miss this. Okay. Apologies for that. So um, can you hear me clearly now? Yeah. Okay. So, who is visible and whose visibility is seen, and also the pol all the politics of this. Uh, to just give this uh, uh, an example is, um, I would like to just give one example. Um, uh, back in June, two thousand the cover of Time magazine. And with the, with the um, subtitle that says the transgender tipping point, which is implying um, we reach the trans visibility and also liberation at the, uh, at the peak point. Um, and I questioned, uh, we questioned, and then including um, LeBron Cox question such reality. Because in the same year, in 2014, uh, 10 to 15 trans body in the US were being killed. And in 2015, close to 25 people were being killed. Uh, trans body were being killed. In 2016, 23. In 2017, 29. In 2018, to the point of uh, the American uh, Association calling it an epidemic, um, all this violence. And all this um, tells us the reality of like, you know, how visibility is not being translated into the actual liberation. When it comes to the day-to-day -day life of, for instance, a black trans um, body, then the, um, the security being secured, being seen as a dignified human, the sanctity of the life of the trans black body is not as the same how the visibility is being um, seen, uh, which goes into the, the politics of symbolism. Um, um, and then, but I would like also to go a little bit more deeper and, and then bring also in, in such even visibilities and understanding and um, a reality, the American exceptionalism. Um, I, uh, back in 2019, um, uh, together with my fellow um, artist, uh, a very formidable artist. I don't know if they are here and uh, hearing me, shout out to Nzamo. We, um, they create, uh, uh, curated um, an art piece for anti-Valentine's to uh, commemorate um, trans life that is being uh, snatched away from us um, in 2019. And, but we had a very intentional uh, and purposeful um, mission, which is to highlight and to bring into the attention and to visibilize the, the oppression and the violence that we, uh, that Black uh, African trans body face. Uh, and what we find was very, um, like, you know, 
was very devastating uh, because of so many, uh, because we, we, as also as non-binary femme, uh, as femme presenting non-binary person, I know uh, how the violence is and I all experience it into my body. And also uh, my friend in Zamo also identifies as femme non-binary body. And we know it from our experience, we do have that memories and we do have that knowledge. But unfortunately, we were not able to gather all this information and uh, collect all this information and, and realize like, you know, how even in such reality where we're talking about like, you know, oh, there is some sort of visibility that is happening um, for queer liberations or for trans liberation um, uh, that is in the US. And then even within that context, there is another nuance, which is like, you know, that not being translated into the day-to-day -day life of Black trans women in um, USA. But, and then when we further go down into the continent of Africa, then we would also have zero ability to see, to gather information um, um, and to have, such visibility. Uh, this also, again, like, you know, another uh, further deep analysis of uh, how the visibility is not um, translating to actual liberation. Because um, for me, data, information is a uh, power uh, that it is through data that we are um, holding people accountable. It is through uh, data that we are holding uh, for our holding uh, legislations and policies uh, accountable, so that they can um, they can be held for holding holding back the the liberation. And another perspective which I would like to talk about is like through these conversations of visibility. I hope uh, what I've talked about also gives you an idea uh, of how the symbolism of visibility and actually not being translated into um, the actual liberation. And the other thing also uh, I want to bring and the perspective is about how the queer, the general uh, queer movement is really centered on uh, cis white men uh, and then it goes into politically the same way as I said, uh, who is going to be seen. So if you are the furthest, away, the furthest, the furthest away you are from that, then the furthest away um, and where your visibility uh, going to be. Um, and this, uh, for me, also uh, brings the the reality, the reality of. Um, uh, the reality of the trans and homophobia as a black body, as an African that I face, and how it's also inter interlinked and uh, communicated. Because most of the times when we talk about trans and um, homophobia in Africa, we tend to speak about, which is you know the majority, which is true. We tend tend to talk about like you know how um, like you know the leaders the the government, the policymakers, the legislators, and the societies and are intolerant, um, aggressive, violent, and all those kinds of things. Um, and then also politically analyzing who, like, you know, where such knowledge came from, uh, which I agree, or I agree is, is, for me, is through the expansions of the imperial expansions and colonialism expansions, and also really, uh, religious expansion. Uh, that happened. Um, but aside from that, um, there is also like w whether it's intentional or unintentional um, contributions from the queer movement being super white and how people also, uh, whenever they're uh, um, curious even to know about, to learn about what is being queer is, and what they find and what they see and what is visible and what is seen is um, whiteness. And that whiteness contributes into the violence that black body face. This is a Western, this is a white thing to do. 
Uh, and I, so I, this is also another example of like, you know, who is seeing the politics of sins within the queer community in a very specific way and how that is being shaped and how, uh, and then, and then how it is affecting uh, the reality of Black African um, queer bodies. Um, and then another perspective, which I would like also to talk about is also uh, the idea of like um, being visible and the hyper visibility of um, uh, the Black body, um, the language and the culture. And if we stop and really investigate and see actually the culture and the language and the vernacular of queer, queerness globally is very black, is very um, uh, black oriented. Um, but in reality, what it values and what it um, amplify and really glorify is whiteness. Um, and this is a contribution also, again, about like, you know, the politics that that is really constructed into the white supremacy through all these expansions and and day to day reality through the racism and, and everything that I mentioned about. Um, so um, so when so when I so when I came to that, um, Paris, uh, that sorry that's to... where all Sorry, sorry to interrupt you now. Just to get the the ball rolling, I'm I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit more what you mean that queerness is is very black thing, but it's amplified um, through whiteness. Because that's uh, I think that that's a very interesting point that can be unpacked. Yes. Okay. So for for instance, um, I'm talking about vernacular. I'm talking about culture i'm talking about how for instance how queerness when we when we see queerness we have our own language we have our own way of communicating and how we uh, uh we do have slangs and all of these things and when you trace that um language and that culture where it is coming from is actually coming from so like, you know, a very simple example is like, you know, um, the conversations we have or the language or you know, the slang we have, like, oh, Sasha, where you say da 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 da, all these kind of things and all this um, um, vernacular that is queerness is using is actually a day-to-day, a day-to-day um, -day language and um, reality of um, black bodies, uh, both black women, as a black uh, cis women, black trans women, and also and also the culture of uh, the culture of ballroom, which is focused on black and Latinx and and people of color. So that's what I meant when I say the the language, uh, the vernacular, and how uh, queerness is really um, moving around at the moment and also being moving around is absolutely is uh, driven from a black culture. Um, Got it, thank but you. But in reality, yeah, but in reality, uh, when, we, when we see um, the actual translations of liberation of, of queerness uh, and who's benefiting, which body is benefiting and whose body is still in a struggle, uh, and in a fight, then it goes back to the hierarchy. So if you are a cis, white, rich, um, gay man, then you basically covered. And we are seeing also, we are seeing these realities where they are protecting their interests, right? Like, uh, for instance, on, uh, I don't know how many of, uh, how many of you are read about the, the results that is coming from the US election, but like, you know, significant amount of queer, white, cis, male are voting for Trump. And that tells a, a, that tells a reality of where, where like, you know, this hierarchy and power is adjacent to. And, and, and 
and where they see um, their benefits is uh, and how they want to protect it. So this is a very simple example. But like, you know, we can just go on and then um, brings about a lot of realities that um, supports my uh, argument. Um, but just to move also to another perspective, which is for me also another perspective of um, uh, in creating in creating visibilities, and when we create these visibilities, it's coming through spaces, uh, and those spaces that is being created, and who is creating it, is already also it's something that we are we have to also analyze, and that I also analyze, and it's the majority of times. Uh, to create a space is um, to create a space requires requires resources and who has that resources is also again is hugely hierarch uh, hierarchical um, and but like when we create that space and when we say for instance we talked about intersectionalities and inviting people and da da da, da and like you know diversities and all of these things uh, I also question that space also. Uh, oftentimes, we, um, I question whether people are aware and are, are done the work of, um, are, are done the work of uh, 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 seeing the people that they are inviting as an autonomous body with opinion, with uh, their own missions and vision, uh, and and if, if the space is, is about uh, um, providing um, a full uh, space for these bodies, or like you know, uh, to just um, give them um, a collaborative space where they also these bodies with a position of power, with a position of resources, to be seen. Um, so, which also I see it from the point of view of uh, voyeurism. Uh, oftentimes, people uh, think about voyeurism as this uh, sexually perverted people uh, littering on other people, um, um, uh, sexual being sexual, or all of all of that kind of thing, which is true. But like my political analysis and also how I understand it is also again is you know there was multiple times where i talk about my pain where i talk about my experience and 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 where people in a position be it in a, from the academy or be it from a different uh, walks of life uh in a positions of power they simply listen to it and see it and do absolutely nothing to change my reality and to contribute for for my liberation uh which is seeing people um, down or as, uh, as their subordinates uh, and, and for the benefit of uh, their knowledge or only extracting that knowledge. So for instance, I've done multiple, so many uh, interviews for people who are doing their PhD, who are doing their master's, who are doing their first, uh, 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 first degree tests. Uh, where I re traumatize myself, where a lot of people re traumatize themselves and contribute a lot of knowledge, and and also like you know the how that knowledge is also being extracted and 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 how it is also con uh, constructed and and give give a guidance how to extract that in that um, information is through not being emotionally connected to your subject. You simply collect all this information and 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 try to be away and detached from from the person who is going through this um, uh, pain. Uh, I mean, there is there is. Uh, I'm I'm not also like you know absolutely uh, dismissing the um, the contribution such analysis such academic analysis to uh, liberation and challenging the policies and the legislation that lawmakers make. But in, um, it's, 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 it's a very uh, complex uh, nuanced reality. Uh, so these are uh, things that I uh, wanted to talk about, but I think we should also 
make it more interactive and then uh, and we can go on. Thank you a lot, Faris. Uh, yeah, we can open it up um, actually right now. I would have a question since I work in the field of digital policies. My question would be, um, do you think there is or do you have the experience that there is a different possibility for visibility for LGBTIQ, asterix, people, refugee people um, in online communities since this uh, digital sphere is like a disruptive technology? Could it disrupt so those power structures, do you think it? Or to turn the question a little bit around, um, do you think the internet helped already visibility or representation of LGBTIQ asterix people? Yes, that um, would be my question. Okay. Uh, I will let, let me just answer that. For, uh, again, I would go back to also my own personal experience. Uh, I've been doing the activism and advocacy work for LGBTI as an Ethiopian, in Ethiopia, for instance. And if it wasn't for internet, if it wasn't for Facebook, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to create this um, grassroots level organizations and movement, and also a community. Uh, I have literally um, a person with me here in Vienna, um, which I call my family by choice. And that happens because of the um, internet. And, but also like, you know, when we started back in 2013 and decided to, or, uh, to organize uh, ourselves and become a collective and a grassroots level organization is through um the reality uh and exploration that we did years before on internet uh, because um you know my reality uh, and to so many to so many ethiopian queer uh, people living in ethiopia reality is internet facebook is uh the same the comparatively the safest space but because you know when we talk about safety when we talk about safe space it's a very elusive thing, right? Um, I'm not saying like, you know, for instance, I've never been, uh, it didn't affect my mental health, for instance, me being, the, uh, me finding my only space where I can see myself is only on Facebook uh, through uh, creating a pseudonym so where I, I cannot show my face. It really plays a lot on my mental health. It really uh, plays a lot on my, self-esteem, how I see myself and all these things, but um, compared to what I have, compared to what I have and how I can express myself, how I can be myself, that, that is the best I can, I can get. So it is, um, it is such, um, I'm, I'm very ambivalent about it because um, with, that re with that reality, I, I know I suffered a lot. With that reality, also I gain a lot. I am the way I am today is because of my um, activism work online because physically I couldn't do it. And that's why I'm also like, you know, an exile here in Austria because I dare to create a collective and a grassroots organization that work and demand the sanctity of the life of queer Ethiopians. But that cost me so many things and I'm, I'm an exile in, um, in a foreign state. So it's, it, I'm very ambivalent about it, but it's very critical. And we, I'm still, for instance, I, um, I'm working, uh, I have another organization which works from the diaspora point of view called the House of Kuramaide. And we are working day and night about, about to realize the liberations of queer Ethiopia. And internet plays a huge role. Great. So it could be a tool to disrupt this power structure that you talked about. It is. Making it is. Because, something. Yes, because, you know, you know, in reality, in, in reality, on a physical issue, uh, the gatekeepers are not allowing us to enter, right? And internet and Facebook and all these social, social media are breaking that gate and giving us an opportunity to say what we want to say, to center ourselves, to talk about who we are and the, the pain and the struggles and also again to create community and come together and center ourselves and really be um, human um, for instance um, uh, during the COVID times last june we uh, did the first uh, horn of african pride 
where, where close to 8,000 people attended. And that to me is, if it wasn't for Facebook, if it wasn't for Zoom, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for internet, that wouldn't be a possibility. But like, you know, all of these things come to its cost. Uh, and as we say, safety, it's a very elusive. Thank you, Faris, for also giving us an insight into the connection between the diaspora and what's happening on the African horn. I just want to like, look at something that you said. You said that you question a lot uh, what uh, makes how people invite uh, others as uh, autonomous bodies. And we know that you have some thinking around inviting people into spaces, uh, uh, to uh, be visible, but also how this can be counterproductive sometimes and the issue around kindness not always being as helpful as, as we think you are. Can you, can you share some more about those thoughts? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for bringing that question. Um, again, <laughs> because I, 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 I really don't like to generalize. Uh, I would like to also bring my own experience on this, like, you know, I've, I've come across two spaces, individuals who are absolutely really kind and really see the things I go through. And actually at some point of, um, at some point in my life, really instrumental for my safety. But at the same time, well, for instance, me, for instance, shifting from Ethiopia, where I, where, for instance, my race is not an issue, to uh, uh, Europe, Central Austria, and where I talk about uh, the racism, the racism I face within the LGBTI community, uh, the racism I face within my closer, uh, closer proximity. And when I, I talk about, and when I want to work on, and when I want to create a collective um, that center blackness, that center uh, black queerness, I come across with the uh, white people who are being, um, who, who created a space for me when I was talking about the only queer issue, uh, were being really um, flat out racist uh, to me. Um, and that shows to me also, like, you know, when we create this kind of spaces, when we are kind and really uh, give, um, give a space for bodies like me. Uh, there are people who use that kindness, that space to silence me, to silence body like me, to silence black people, not to talk about the reality of racism, to silence uh, all kinds of people, not to talk about the reality that these isms are creating. Um, so it is a tool. People use kindness to silence other people to silence um, uh, the, autonom the autonomous right that we have as a human being. And so that, that's also like, you know, when I was uh, talking about um, when we create this space, uh, are you ready to accept um, the people that you're inviting uh, to be their autonomous self, to be their uh, fullest self? And, 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 and are you ready to be questioned? your visions and missions and imaginations to be questioned by them. Yeah. Okay, Faris, we have some questions from the audience. Um, I will give you two because they are somehow connected. One is, um, thank you for your very interesting input. And could you um, give us one or two examples for true visibility versus symbolic politics? And the one who would connect to it from my point of view is how um, how and why visibility has become such a popular slogan? Do you can elaborate on that? Um, why visibility? I I <laughs> I, I think visibility. Uh, all of these things become become really popular. Um, I think it's because of the oppression, because of the white supremacy, and it's um, day to day uh, practice. Right, like uh, if it were, if if we were not being silent, uh, I I really don't, don't have the reason to just come and 
it goes it goes into also to the reality of this dominance, this uh, dominance selecting um, on this hierarchy. These are the only voice that is going to be heard. These are the only bodies that is going to be seen. You have to be white, you have to be rich, you have to be blonde, you have to be this and that, and like, you know, slender to be um, desired, to be um, seen, to be, um, uh, uh, to be a, a full human being and celebrated. Uh, and that, that reality and that, um, that part of our life is hugely uh, shaped by white supremacy. And, and the idea of us really talking about visibility, visibility, and all this kind of thing comes from, to, from the necessity work that to define such um, reality. So mm -hmm. I think visibility become this big issue because of white supremacy, because of the domination and the, the, in, the indoctrinations that we have on our day-to-day -day life that is affecting all of us. So a little bit like a counter thing, you think? To, for white um, people to be more visible against uh, black people? Did I get that right? Or no, because uh, like you know, and and uh, I think in my also in my understanding and also the uh, definition also like you know, I don't think not not all white people are equally visible. I don't mm -hmm. believe that uh, because uh, I know um, a rich cis white male is more visible than uh, a rich uh, cis white woman. Uh, yeah. There comes the the misogyny, and then and and you know like so it 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 it, 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 it comes all of uh, to all to all of this. For instance, you know if you know your body type, what kind of body do you have? Are you able? Are you this and that? Are mm -hmm. you queer and all of that? So all of this, when I say uh, previously, uh, it indoctrinates the hierarchy. That's what I mean. So like, you know, even within this hierarchy, there are hierarchies, but also um, uh, there is the complacent, uh, being complacent, and also like, you know, uh, people aspiring to be adjacent to this uh, top of the hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've seen, we've seen in, in the general feminism, in white feminism, how they left behind uh, the black feminism. Yeah, black women. and uh, the gender spectrum feminism, right? Mm. Because that was the aspiration. Because it was, you know, a bunch of like, you know, uh, the white feminism was aspiring to be a white man, mm -hmm. right? I mean, before, so, um, no, I completely, um, completely uh, want to second your point there that there is uh, also some. There is also people who are oppressed within the oppressed group and, and also people who are oppressed within the very visible groups. And we really want to like, I, I, we really want to push this, that everyone should be able to uh, show up as their full itself uh, in, in, in all the spaces, that, you know. And, and so I think it's a really, I just want to squeeze in a question from the audience who's, who's asking uh, if you think this should be, this issue about disability should be addressed in school as well um absolutely <laughs> um as you know as you were uh, as you were saying um that uh, you know like all of the all of the things that i'm telling you like uh there are like certain bodies that is being visible um, it's already happening in school, right? Like uh, the, this, it manifests in a very insidious way. And it's in our schooling system. Yeah, it's in our history. How history is being written. It's in our, uh, it's in our day-to-day -day vernacular. It is uh, in our day-to-day -day activities. So like, you know, all this counter work um, uh, that needs to happen, uh, which is which is me saying like you know this, the work of visibility 
really actually translating to the liberation that needs to be taught um, in, in schools. It, it needs to really trickle down to our, our day to day activity because, because white supremacy and this dominance is working insidiously on day to day. It's, it's, it's very insidious. And, and if we, uh, if all of us are not thinking uh, such kind of visibility, uh, how people uh, see themselves if it's not being taught in school, then we are really fooling ourselves, right? Because it's already being in, a, in edu it's already in our education system, it's already in our media, it's already in our uh, history book, it's already everywhere. Yes, so we need to oh, be yeah. mindful of what we what we read in our history books as well as we read as we as we read them yeah. and understand who's visible, who's mm -hmm. there's not visible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can I come back? Um, because also sorry. No, talk. Because so, sorry, also because also like you know, another point and also another perspective is also like you know, this shapes also the the desirability uh policy, right? Be it sexually. Uh, like you know who is sexually desired who is datable who is really seen as beautiful and all of this and then also when i talk about also desirability i'm also talking about who is desired to be productive in this capitalistic world even have that hierarchy which is really adjacent into what i talked about and um so like uh who is desired to enter into university who is desired to enter uh, a certain uh, high level of work, who is desired to, very simple things, who is desired to be in front of the TV as a news anchor, is absolutely um, um, fall into this visibility politics and how we see and who is seen and who is allowed to be seen fall into this. So, yeah. I'm muted here and before Francesca close, uh, I just also want to include this last question as well, uh, because your answers are very valuable to us and we want to know why do you think that uh, this knowledge of um, uh, such a structural practice, why do you think, uh, where do you think it's coming from? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, um, an audience is asking, why do you think this uh, such knowledge of structural practice, where do you think it comes from? Oh, I, th I thought I've already said it, from white supremacy. I think you have, but I think we need to hear it as well. <laughs> You're more than welcome it, to finish. And I'll say it again, it's from the white supremacy, because white supremacy air manifested in multiple ways, in a very insidious on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I come from the space that was never colonized uh, called Ethiopia, but white supremacy work function really well, even in that space. So uh, it manifests through colorism, it manifests from, through anti-blackness within the, within the people of color. It manifests in so many ways, it's insidious. So to answer your question again, White supremacy. Yes, I mean, this detachment definitely comes from white supremacists and it's colonial roots, really, that's just been uh, passed on from generation to generation. And a lot of uh, this colonial history uh, is, um, is kind of forgotten and also uh, kind of hidden. So you have to dig to find it. Uh, I mean, yeah. For example, uh, we know, uh, like my heritage is Ugandan, and we know that uh, former tribal kings uh, were engaging with same-sex partners and uh, women living together in communities uh, um, uh, as partners as well. They were seen as um, uh, as um, kind of having special powers because they were living in these communities. But then after colonization and the role of religion, this has been wiped, wiped out, not only globally, but within these uh, Ugandan communities as well. And so we can see, for example, a colonial amnesia and uh, we still see some amnesia today, basically. And um, 
and yeah. so white supremacy yeah. is a very subtle and I, I, yeah yeah i yeah. absolutely agree with you but yet and then at the same time also i would like to also piggyback on that also because this this amnesia and also this also forgive uh, forgiveness is also the finest form of of the its manifestations right so like you know when a machine really function like 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 a well oiled machine then like you know we don't need to check it we don't need to it's become insidious it's become really hard to identify and so like you know when it's it's, it's getting to the highest peak uh that's that's how it is, you know, it's become invisible because it doesn't need a reinforcement. It doesn't need any rules and regulations to be in place because it was indoctrin indoctrinated into our body. For instance, me as a black person born and raised in Ethiopia, in Africa, I woke up every day and hated my, my, uh, my skin, my dark skin. Why is that? Yeah? It's, it's because the insidious work of white supremacy and the insidious work of how who is desired that is being we are being programmed through our textbooks through our history through our all of these things right so like you know so i you know it, it, it is it, i'm i'm like a day-to-day -day work of uh, that like you know i am day and every day i'm unlearning so many anti-blackness within my country that I was um, indoctrinated. Yeah. Faris, I have uh, the job to close up now. Thank you very, very much for your knowledge and the experience you shared with us, your experience you shared with us. I think we have a lot to think about now and we have a lot of work to do. Um, we as a society, but uh, also as a group of LGBTIQ people, whoever uh, is this here. Um, thanks, really, thank you a lot. Uh, for the audience, um, if you would like to learn more about the recognition and prevention of violence against, against LGBTIQ persons on the move, there will be an online symposium on the 13th of November. Um, all the inform necessary information you will find um, on the website of the Gunnar Institute. I think uh, the link is already posted here. We will see us probably uh, next year uh, with a new edition of the Feminist Explorations. Uh, at least I hope so. Um, until then, thank you very much. Thank you, Pauline. You have the last word if you want to. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Faris, for sharing your thank personal you for experiences. Having me. It was a really and thank thank you. you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, participants, for tuning thank in. You. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Yes. Yeah, thank you a lot. Bye.